Welcome back. And we're going to move right into Rodell's talk on how low can we go optimizing hemoglobin. Rodell. Okay. So uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting subject. I mean, we all, we all go on bypass and we all have issues um, with with hemodilution. You know, and we talk about uh, hemodilutional anemia, um, and that's a true. You know, along with it, you get acute renal failure, poor tissue oxygenation, and uh, prolonged ventilator support. You know that that's all that's all it. it, it and with the uh, hemodilutional anemia <clears throat> related. And what I, what I went through is going through a bunch of, of articles talking about this, this uh, hemodilution and transfusion. Um, and this, this one is, is talking about the impact of a hematocrit of 20% during a normothermic cardiopulmonary bypass. Which is quite interesting. This study is is normal normothermic. Um, you look at all the other studies. Nobody really talks about the temperature. Everybody goes down to your thirty two degrees. Nobody really accounts for that temperature difference. Um, and it was a randomized study. And is there? You know, we also talk about the minimum safe level of hematocrit to maintain the oxygen uh, delivery during during bypass. Um, uh, this study was was prospective, uh, randomized, and uh, had controlled data. Uh, patient, patients were subject to the normothermic uh, CPB at 35 to 36 degrees Celsius, and they were observed until discharged from the ICU and uh, outcomes were measured um, and calculated with a whole body oxygen delivery, um, consumption and the clinical outcome. Uh, primary outcome measures of this trial were calculated with whole body oxygen delivery, um, mixed venous blood and lactate uh, during CPB and at the end of surgery and the ICU. Um, the patient population wasn't wasn't as high in this in this actual study, but it was still quite interesting. Um, th it was 54 patients where uh, crit of 25% and uh, crit of 20% in 26 patients. Um, let's see. I'm the great order that Joe is. Um, and statistically, the, the outcomes were not different between the groups. Uh, no myocardial infarction was detected in the groups as well. So, which is quite interesting. And we talk about like the difference between 20% and 25%, you know, and you, you hear that the 20% is going to get transfused. Well, does this actual data shows like, hey, we don't need a transfusion at 20%. There is not a statistical difference with the oxygen delivery. And we also we talk about like that, that tissue perfusion. And this data shows that during normothermic, uh, a, a normothermic situation, there's, there's no statistical difference. So that was quite interesting, 20%. You know, how low, again, how low can we go? Well, you know, I mean, 20% seems to be like a trigger number out there right. um, around here. I've worked in other areas where the trigger number is 18. Yeah. And so uh, I don't like the idea of trigger numbers at all because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of other aspects to who gets transfused other than the, the percentage of their hematocrit or their hemoglobin. It's more about the patient because the older the patient is, you know, you're probably, that's, that's a factor. You know, you get an older patient, um, they probably are going to have more issues with the blood flow to their, to their brain just from age, you know, from having more um, uh, uh, vascular disease. And so, you know, those patients, maybe 20% is the number that you, you trigger to give a, tra a transfusion. But right. then there are other patients who, you know, a lot of, we're fortunate enough in the area that we work in around here that a lot of our patients are in their 50s and 60s. Right. And they don't need a transfusion at 18%. I don't think they do. Yeah. 
So, so in this, it was quite interesting. The hematocrit as low as 20% during norothermic was not associated with higher incidence of acute renal failure. Again, it, you know, if in the earlier slide, you know, we were talking about the hypovolemia. So, again, it, it wasn't, that statistically was, was very interesting to me. Um, the oxygen delivery to the kidneys was maintained since the post-op creatinine levels and urine volumes and the usage of the U loop diuretics weren't shown, but it was not significant between the 25% and the 20%, which was, again, interesting to me. It's like, hey, maybe 20 is, is the lowest. Um, yeah, let's see here. So uh, this here is, is, is a large prospective study, the hemodilution during cardiopulmonary bypass in, in, as an independent risk for acute renal failure in adult cardiac surgery w was, was uh, that's okay. I was just going to speak about this. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, going through all the, uh, going through all the literature, this, this often came up. This talked about the, the risk of the acute renal failure, and it did show that it wasn't really much of a acute renal um, injury. Um, and it supported, and it supported the, the data that was in the previous study that I just talked about. Um, so in this, in, in, make sure I understood what you just said. You're saying in this circumstance, in this study, hemodilution yeah. during cardiac bypass is an, is an independent risk factor right. for acute renal failure. They, they, they concluded it was. Correct. Okay. Uh, correct. But what, okay. So what was the question, Joe? I'm sorry. To, to what degree of hemodilution? Oh, to, to, the, to that 20. To that 20. To that 20. Okay. To that 20, which, which is a large perspective study. And it was, again, quite interesting. You know, it's... it's you know, this really, you know, going through all this literature really kind of changed my mind about, about certain transfusion triggers um, and, and things like that. I mean, I've always had them, but now it's, it's a little more of a solid base. Um, I'm trying to... So you're, you, you, from the studies that you've read, you're a proponent of transfusion at 20%? No, I'm actually not. I'm actually not. We're, 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 I, we have to look at the whole picture, and I'll get to I'll get to that whole picture in a second, because there there is a there is a guideline that the STS um, that projects with with a tolerable level of of uh, hemoglobin. Don't forget you have to do yes. this. One yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so. This was quite interesting. I mean, this is, this is a editorial. Is the patient or the physician that can't tolerate the anemia? <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah. It is. It's actually a perspective <laughs> analysis of, you know, uh, 1,800 patients non-transfused during coronary artery uh, bypass surgery. Um, many a time where I've come to the OR and the patient's SVO2 is, is high, you know, we've got excellent diuresis, you know, well over one cc per kilo per hour in a 50-year-old patient, but the anesthesiologist is uncomfortable with a 7.1 hemoglobin. They have this, I wouldn't say archaic, but a trained notion of, hey, you know what, seven is not good. We need the transfuse. I mean, are they thinking about the deleterious uh, effects of, of, of red cells. And what do I have in my toolbox to say like, hey, doc, I can't, you know, transfuse this patient because this, this, and this. I need a tool to tell me that, to say like, hey, we're okay. There's very many times where this, or, uh, this anesthesiologist or even surgeon, mind you, say like, no, just transfuse, it, much to my chagrin. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, I'm just a perfusionist and I'm, I am following orders, but I, I as, as a patient advocate, does not want to, you know, transfuse. I will, I, if you guys were having surgery, I'm going to do everything in my power not to transfuse, only because I know the deleterious effects of yeah. red, red yeah. blood cell usage. And I appreciate that, but don't wrap me either. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> you never know. You would never know. You know, something else about uh, transfusions, which is, is out there and is well studied, is that 
uh, and I hear this all the time, well, we've already broken the seal on blood products, right. so let's just give more. But right. one transfusion is bad. Yes. Two transfusions is not double bad. Correct. It's a hundred times batter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know batter isn't a word. I just batter is that. not a but word. But the reason is because you've got antibodies that are going to react against antibodies from the first one and the patients. Correct. Right. So, um, yeah, transfusion is bad all around. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Nobody can argue against that. Nobody can argue against that. Um, but we will talk about it. So this next study is what really shaped my my uh my practice um and it, and it has and it, it, it's a study that we used to give the students when we had when i was teaching um our our, our clinical coordinator would would always give this study as as homework um talking about transfusion and lowest hematocrit on cardiopulmonary bypass um it's 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 the renucci study um, and this study is actually a multivariate um, study um, and it attempts, the study attempts to evaluate the effects of the nadir hematocrit. It doesn't actually give you the actual value of it. It just talks about the lowest hematocrit um, during bypass and the use of allergenic uh, blood transfusions according to the outcome of the cardiac surgery. Um, it's a prospective study in, in three different uh, Italian uh, hospitals, um, and it's got you know almost eighteen hundred cabbage patients. Um, wh what's nice is you know they, they all had a this similar method uh, of perfusing, so there's very few aberrant practice patterns. So it's a it's a nice study, um, and it showed that the, the nadir hematocrit of of bypass is an independent risk for the low output syndrome and renal failure. So that, that again, f I was finding that you know this this hema dilution may may not be may not cause this this um, major uh, failure renally. So um, it, it showed that after blood transfusions um, were included in this study. Uh, low output syndrome is associated with the transfusions, and the nadir hematocrit on CPB loses the statistical differences. So, again, showing that transfusions are bad, um, it's just as bad as hema dilution. So, again, it's Joe talked about the risk reward um, in in this. Um, and after blood transfusions are included in the analysis, renal failure is significantly associated with the transfusions. So that was, again, we talk about the perfusion to, tissue perfusion to the, uh, to the, to the renal system. Are we, are we giving this, 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 uh, this oxygen, this hemoglobin to the actual, actual uh, delivery to the um, renal system? Uh, and within the group, the hematocrits were less than 23%. It does show some, some value. Um, transfusions doubled the risk of renal failure. Um, and it showed, analysis showed that uh, similar hematocrit cutoff values for low output syndrome and, and renal failure. Uh, mortality did not correlate with the nadir hematocrit as well. So, very interesting. Um, to conclude, and in their conclusions, the nadir hematocrit on CPB played a role in affecting the outcome after CAB. Um, the findings showed that severe anemia on CPB is a likely determinant of low output syndrome and a definite risk factor for postoperative renal failure. In addition, the role of transfusions has been established for acute renal failure because a nadir hematocrit on CVB is one of the major determinants of allergenic blood transfusions. You know, so, so again, the 20% 20, 20 hematocrit, we're getting this blood, and now we're showing this same type of outcome of, of hemodilution. So we're almost chasing our tails at this point is what this study is showing. 
Um, and the rule should be considered in church, and with this rule, it should be considered in the, uh, the idea of trying to transfuse. Um, so let's talk about, you know, the three evils of the red cells. Um, you know, the transfusion, the anemia, or both. Um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, is, it is the fight between, and there was, there was an actual study that, that was titled, you know, transfusion, the relationship between God and the devil. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't include that one. But, you know, you, you find a lot of these, um, you find a lot of these studies. And oh, I've seen this. Before. Yes, this everybody really, has really seen this or, or may have not seen this. This is a great slide. This is a great this, slide. So it's good. So, so this is the age of blood. This is your packed red cells. I mean, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody, you know, looks at your expiration dates of your, your packed cells. Like, hey, um, you know, perfusion X, please transfuse this patient. Well, you get this pack cell and you look at it and it's not expired. It's one day before one day, expiration. One Most day of before time, expiration. Yeah. I mean, we've all, I mean, I don't know if you've inspected old blood, but you know, you, you see that there's a sludge, if you will, you know, you, you see all these things, but under an electron microscope, it shows you these, these, uh, these pictures. Um, one other thing about uh, donor blood is that yeah. as it ages, the two, three DPG, Goes, it's depleted. Know, it's depleted. depleted. It's and depleted. so those cells don't actually start to carry oxygen or Correct. CO2 until, I think it's 24 hours. I don't remember the number, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a while. It's, it's, it's a while. On, it's, it's a while. on your presentation? Okay. Yeah, so. It's in the presentation, but okay. yeah, actually, no, that's an excellent point. I mean, we see these, we see these pseudopodia even at day 21. And what is that causing? Is that causing coagulation? Is that causing, you know, the, the body to, to create like a platelet or a platelet aggregation system? Is, is, it, is it starting the coagulation system? And a patient who is already compromised with coronary artery uh, disease, you're throwing this in, mm -hmm. you know? And- Don't forget the change. Oh, yes. Thank you. So, you know, Patrick talked about the depletion of 2,3-DPG, shifting that dissociation curve, you know, uh, to the left and reducing the oxygen delivery. You so, become an oxygen yeah, sink. Exactly. Exactly. So, so did we really help that patient with that, that packed red cell for the, for the first intended use of, of that, that red cell? Um, you know, you see, you see all this, you know, we talk about, I just talked about the, the microparticles um, in, in this that, that, that come off. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not always a great product to give, but a necessary product to give. At times. At times. At and times. I think I, that I'm we not... don't know what those at times are. Right. And then, of course, you know, where are we in the development of, well, you may be talking about it uh, in your talk, where are we in the development of a heme a non-heme oxygen carrying substitute. Right. There's, a, there's some incredible work that's being done by uh, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Simpkins up in, uh, up in uh, Shreveport at LSU. And uh, he's developing a solution that is not only oxygen carrying capable and delivering capable, but also it is adsorbing of and clearing of inflammatory mediators simultaneously. Mm. So he's got this incredible fluid, and I can't remember the name of his company. I'm going to have to add that maybe to the video post yeah. because uh, he's doing some incredible work. Came to New Orleans and gave a talk on that topic, and it was really, really interesting. Well, I would like to prime the pump with that. Yes, well, wouldn't I think you that's think? The I mean, if, if, yeah, if, and, if we're talking, if yes. we're talking about about you know hemodilution. Right. I would like to have something right. I'm like sure that. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly expensive. Yeah, I'm but, sure. Um, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, I think that, yeah, yeah, I'll get that information and I'll add it to the end of this presentation when, we, when, when Roger does the final editing and add that on there because it's really fascinating work that he's doing. Baxter had something that they were working on for a while as well, but they were going to uh, market it to trauma. Yeah. Right. To put and this is a trauma office. surgeon, by the way. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Is, is, a, uh, is, a, is a trauma surgeon in Shreveport. Well, it's medical practical values. <laughs> I'd love to prime the pump with that. 
you know, and you know, we talk about the, the decrease in, in, in the deformability and impeding like the microvascular flow within the lungs, within, within well, they, you the you know, whole that system. picture that you showed, they, they've taken red blood cells and actually yeah. put them, you know, the age cells mm -hmm. in an accelerometer. Yeah. And you know, the red blood cells to get through the capillary system have to deform. Sure. Right. But they don't, do, at deform. some point, they stop right. deforming. Sure. Yes. And so you you get, you know, a, aggregation, a, a plug, essentially plugging of yes. your microcapillary system. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's, of course, not good for you either. So, I mean, nope. yeah, it, it, blood transfusions, I mean, just are, are, are right. horrible. Uh, unnecessary evil. Unnecessary evil, absolutely. You know, and, and, and we talk about our transfusion related. Uh, lung injury. I mean, we, we talked. We can talk to our anesthesiologists and, and surgeons about trolley and and taco. You know, those transfusion related. I love tacos. Yes, I I, I do too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, I get you get you get exposure to the, your bloodborne pathogens. You know, your hepatitis, mm -hmm. your HIVs. I mean, we we have we have you know since gotten the the blood banks have since gotten better. Um, you know, screening for things, but we can't catch everything. Mm -hmm. We can't catch everything. And, and also the, the blood products are starting to deplete. I mean, not as many people are, are you know, um, uh, donating anymore, which mm -hmm. is quite interesting. So, so, you know, if we can reduce the, the, the blood usage, you know, that it would help all around. I mean, there's very many times these last couple of weeks where, Hey, um, we're going to need blood or, Hey, we're going to need platelets, but, uh, we're out. We're going to have to go down on the Gulf coast and we're, we're up here. We're up here in, in North Houston. And that's coming from like an hour and a half away. If you go to the med center, go to any of the, the blood, the, the, you know, past by the pathology lab, the blood bank areas, they have a, 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 a thing up pool. of all of the different yeah. types of blood and platelets right. and all of that kind of thing. And uh, you just look into the, it tells what their, what their levels are. And it's critical, 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 yeah. critical, critical. I mean, it's always critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any question. Blood is at a, uh, at a shortage and a premium right now. Yeah. And good donors, don't people who you want donating are at a premium yes, as well. Yes, as well, yeah. as well. I mean, so don't go get your tattoos, you millennials. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know those millennials. That's those millennials, we those just millennials with their tattoos, and they can't trans, they can't donate, and they can't start a case till ten forty-five. Correct. Well, <laughs> I, I don't mind that. I don't mind that either. So, you know, again, starting with this talk, what is the min How low can we go? This, I don't know if you can all see this. Um, STS, the Society for Thoracic Surgeons. Um, in which a lot of our surgeons use their guidelines. And it shows that, that six grams per deciliter is the safe uh, operating value for CPB, which, again, to me, can be very, can be very, um, could be very, thank you, Joe, could be very unsettling, you know, a, a crit of 18. You know, what are we going to do here? So it, it shows that it, it's a, re, it's, okay. In this. So indications for, for the transfusion of red cells in this setting are multifactorial. So again, in the guidelines, it, it does give this disclaimer, if you will, at, at the six, six, uh, six uh, deciliters from, per ml. Um, it's multifactorial. It should be guided by patient-related factors. That's like age, the, the severity of the illness, the cardiac function, or the risk of critical end-organ ischemia. Um, the, like the, the actual clinical setting, I mean, are we, are we actively bleeding? Um, things like that. And uh, the laboratory, w which is quite interesting, are we using co-oximetry? How are we getting this six, six uh, deciliters oh, yeah. per ml? Oh yeah, what are we using to measure exactly? What are we using and to measure? That's my talk. That's my and next talk. Yes, I, I won't. I, I do have some stuff. Well, I, you go I ahead. did look. Yeah, no, I, I can reinforce I, I'm not, it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, no, I'll reinforce you. <laughs> it's your talk. Um, so, what are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish for our heart patients? And I mean, again, I was talking about from pre-op all the way to discharge. Next, Joe. Um, 
when we were talking about he optimizing the hemoglobin. Am I going over? Yeah, yeah it's oh, okay. a little, but that's okay. okay. I apologize. You're fine. So uh, I'll try to go quickly. Um, we're talking about the team approach. We're talking about like talking to the anesthesiologist. We're talking to pre-op. Have we gotten erythropoietin? You know, are we treating these patients like Jehovah's Witness patients? Are we increasing their iron uh, capacity? So, you know, our, our tissue oxygenation and delivery system is at its optimal level. Um, you can go next, Joe. Uh, we, can, we can employ restrictive transfusion protocols in that pre, intra, and post-operative situation. Uh, the recognition of the multivariate factors such as age, sex, renal status, procedure type, and post-op blood loss. Um, in the study and going through all the papers, I found that sex was a very important factor. Women tolerated the anemia better than men did. And that's, that was quite interesting because women tend to have the lower BSAs than men. Yeah. So, and, and they, they, under, they, they can see that heme dilution because also the theory was because of their menzies and, and losing or shedding that blood, they've, their body is preconditioned to a type of heme dilution. Huh. So that was quite interesting. That is interesting. That was very, very interesting. Um, and talk about perfusion technique, retrograde autologous priming. <laughs> that is actually yeah, in, let's talk again, about that. Yes. <laughs> so that again is in the guidelines within STS. They are. It is. Um, it is. So again, I I feel safe practice, and so does STS, according to uh, miniature circuits. Um, people stopped talking about those for a little bit. We used to run them back home in Detroit, and with with great with great success, uh, people would come in with crits of thirty and leaving with crits of thirty one mm -hmm. out of the room. Mm -hmm. So that was quite. I mean, you're basically sneaking on bypass with that patient's volume. I mean, there's very little. I mean, I think there was a priming volume of maybe three hundred or maybe even two hundred with wrap, mm -hmm. and that only includes the crystalloid from the cardioplegia circuit. Um, the use of integrated filters or smaller oxygenators. Um, Trumo has a prescriptive oxygenation um, protocol um, with, with a certain kilo weight and BSA. Um, I know that uh, one of our Memorial Hermans believes in the prescriptive oxygenation. Um, Hemocompatible tubing. Uh, the, the coatings that, that in which we run our perfusion circuits. Um, it's what its goal is to improve your, your platelet preservation, uh, reduces your co uh, activation of coag factors, your, and reduces the inflammatory reactions. Um, that that is, you know, your X coatings. Your I forget what what is smart the, the, the smart physio coding. the smart There's coding the yes, physio yeah. the physio coding. The use of hemoconcentrators and, 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 and cell salvaging devices. Um, and we're, we'll, let's talk about, you know, we talked about erythropoietin, your antifibrinolytics, your, 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 your amicars, your, your transexamic acids, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna um, your, your fibrinolytics, you know, stop you, stop you from, from DIC. Uh, DDAVP with your Von Willebrand's uh, factor and, uh, Factor seven in your factor se uh, factor seven. You're initiating your your coags. Hey, Joe. Oh, yeah. So so not only is, are, are we talking about red cell transfusion, I'm also talking about your 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 platelets, your plasmas. If we actually take care and optimize you know, our, our, our blood management and your fluid management, um, I feel that you won't need, you won't need these, these different types of uh, blood products. You know, the, the FFPs and, and your, plasma, your plasmas and, and your platelets also bring down your hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So if, if I can reduce all those different types of blood products, your hemoglobin just stays 
that much higher. I think those are great points, all great points. And thank you very much. That was very informative. You didn't even mention, though, I have to say, the cost. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's- We didn't even talk about yeah, cost. Yeah, I could have talked about cost. You know, the, 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 the price of the um, procurement of a red cell, the, the procurement of, you know, the, the cryoprecipitates and things like that. It's, it's an expensive process. I well, mean, you know, well, doctors- I have something to say about cost. Yeah. Uh, it's not, so the cost around the country is about, they say about six to $700 yes. per unit. Per unit. That's the raw cost. The raw That's the cost. raw cost. But the cost to the hospital is a lot more because oh, yes. there's a known uh, increased risk of, of uh, having a, a fever, you know, yeah, post transfusion related. Yeah, the morbidity. real cost is yes. around two thousand dollars a unit. Yes, right. Yes, and that's out of Dr. Hannon's book. Dr. Hannon has a book. I've been trying to remember that name for the longest yeah, time. Yeah, Tim Hannon. And, Tim, uh, he has that. Book, yes, and he talks about the cost of transfusions, but then he talks about the real cost of transfusions. Right. And they're really quite high comparison to just the raw cost. The real cost is anywhere between. It depends on what you look at, but it's between eighteen hundred and up to twenty eight hundred dollars right. per because of what you just said. There are patients who are going to have a transfusion related Reaction. morbidity yeah. and they can be quite expensive. They can have transfusion related acute lung injury. They can go into ARDS secondary to it. They can have transfusion Transfusion associated circulatory overload and go into heart failure. They can have a transfusion reaction. They can have all kinds of things occur, which are very expensive and extrapolated out or averaged out over all transfusions. It is very expensive. Not to mention, I mean, not that we want to go back to transfusions again, but but not to mention the blood supply is limited. Yes, it's not only limited, but it's actually getting less, and the need for blood seems to be going up. So it's a it's it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. But clearly, physiologically, transfusions are not good things. Right. It 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 showed all these studies showed it's it's actually worse for the patient to get transfused in some circumstances. In some circumstances, I mean, in, in actually, in most of my studies, I found that it's it's more deleterious. Again, it's it's a risk reward benefit. Yes. Um, it and I found that you know red cells were just that much worse. There's yeah. also, there's an argument for hemodilution and if you're gonna be using right. hypothermia. Right. To a point. Right, absolutely. You know, you, you lowered blood viscosity at, at that point, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did have that slide, but I took it out. <laughs> okay, so um, that was very good. I'm gonna go right into, if it's okay, my talk on uh, POC devices and reliability, because I think this plays into your, uh, your discussion as well. So in, oh, what happened there? You went what I do? too forward. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, okay, so does anybody know what clinical laboratory improvement amendments is? So we've all heard it before, but I'll it's bet clear. no one's, CLIA, clear. it's clear. CLIA. That's what it is, and it was established in 1988 as an experiment in POC testing. So POC, of course, as we know, is performed on many, many different types of tests. It's done in doctor's offices, at homes. A glucometer is a POC device. A hemoglobin A1C is a POC device. Um, you can do uh, elect basic electrolytes. You can do uh, hematology. You can do just about, you can do even in the emergency department, a troponin level if you think a patient has come in that's had an MI as confirmation of that. So, and of course it's done in the hospitals as well. I wanna give you all some perspective on the POC or point of care industry. In 2001, it was a $4.9 billion industry. That's a ton That's a of money. money, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. POC uh, is a huge industry, very powerful industry. But of course, our concern, we are predominantly perfusionists, and I think predominantly perfusionists online as well. Um, but, you know, in the CVOR, we use it for blood gases, electrolytes, metabolites, and of course, 
hemoglobin. And that's really what my focus is on the hemoglobin portion of this. There are three key elements that you have to consider when evaluating point of care testing laboratory devices. One, does it shorten time to result? Well, I mean, I think we all agree that most of them do. We have yeah. to send it to the lab. Right. The old days of sending it to the lab oh. and the, the, the person who would take it to the lab would first stop off at the cafeteria for a yeah. little lunch before right. bringing the sample to the uh, to the laboratory or the laboratory didn't know it got dropped off and right. we're all sitting yeah. there exactly. waiting, where's our result, where's our result, where's our result? It yeah. drives you absolutely bonkers, yeah. especially when you think you have a bad result that exactly. you really want to know how bad it is or is it really bad. Yeah, 25 um, minute turnaround time. It's horrible. <laughs> is the device reliable? Can you depend upon it? And I don't mean that in terms of what the third thing is, which is accuracy, but is it reliable? When you turn it on or when you are ready to do a test, is it available and functioning? That's what I refer to when I talk about reliability in this particular talk. And are the results accurate? That's very important. Are they accurate? Can you rely on the results that you are receiving? So I want to show you some of the more popular POC devices. Each of these devices has advantages, each of these devices have disadvantages and it becomes a matter of, do we even know all of these devices actually exist or do we only think it's the one that we currently use? If you've only been one place for any length of time, you may not even realize how many different devices there actually are on the market. And I don't know if this isn't all of them. These are the more yeah, popular yeah. ones that I'm familiar with. I've used so on the left, of course, we <laughs> see the Abbott iStat, which was really first on the market when it came to POC technology. And uh, they developed this device. I can't remember the year, but it's been quite some time. And uh, they've been extremely good at marketing their device and so forth. And it has some advantages. We're going to talk about those advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but then next to it, you have the Siemens uh, technology. This is the Siemens Rapid Point 500, which is a device I particularly like. Um, you have next to it the radiometer device, which is also a very good, this is the ABL or radiometer um, device. And I think this is the, I can't tell you what yeah, model that is. Yeah, I don't remember the, the model number. The ABL so then, 80. It's the, that's the, the 80, 80 coax. And yeah. that's then next to it is the uh, Gem uh, 3500. I think they have the Gem, this <laughs> might be after the Gem 30 ah. Premier. I don't really know. Right. But nevertheless, each of these devices have advantages and disadvantages. I want to point a couple of these out while we're sitting here right now. So if you look at these devices, the obvious advantage, let's see, is it going to work? Yep. Yeah. Okay. The obvious advantage is in this model, it is literally handheld. You can carry this thing around with you from anywhere to anywhere and do whatever it is that you want to do, as long as you carry the cartridges with you. This device has a is, a is a tabletop platform. It can be on a cart. It can move around the hospital uh, uh, very easily. So, it, and it has its own backup battery supply and the whole thing like that. It is not a gigantic desktop model like you see in the blood a gas labs right. um, down in the laboratory yes. or the pathology department, but it is, uh, it certainly isn't handheld. You, it's luggable. It's not <laughs> really, or, or pushable on a cart. But some of the advantages that this has is that it has a lower lock input right here, which makes it almost mindly just connect it, hit the button, and you can leave it and it will draw the sample. The other thing it has, of course, is up here, you have a printer readily available. In this model over here, the Abbott iStat, you have to, I guess, laser connect it, it to a printer, dock right. it to a printer, and then it's a separate device. So if you did want a printer, then you would have to carry that printer with you along with this handheld device. The ABL machine over here also has uh, a port, but its port comes out 
and it's a needle and you have to insert the needle into the syringe sample and you have to hold it there until it draws the sample up. So in that regard, I think this device with that Lorlock technology is very helpful. It also has a printer though, and uh, it is uh, uh, certainly a solid device. And then you have the gem over here. It also has, if you can look right there, that needle comes out to aspirate the syringe, the sample from the syringe. So you have to stand there during that period of time, but it also has a printer. Now these three are all in the same class. They're all luggable devices, mostly meant to be on a cart to move around or put in the heart room. This one is clearly the one that has the handheld. Uh, which is the easiest of all to just walk around with or transport or move. But there's some other things that I'll bet most people don't really think about. And that has to do with liquid QCs. In the case of this device and this model of this device, the QCs, the, the electronic QCs, are not electronic, but the, the, they're all liquid QCs from the <coughs> cartridge, are actually done through the measurement pathway. And because they are done through the measurement pathway, you do not have to do liquid QCs on these devices. You can, but you don't have to because the QCs, which are liquid in the cartridges, which are behind these doors, are actually measured through the measurement pathway. In the case of the GEM technology, it is not. It is a separate pathway. Therefore, this always has to have, this device always has to have liquid QCs as does this device when you have either, depending on your hospital, a new patient or you have a new lot number. It could be any of or both of those. Yeah. So, and it is quite time consuming and in my opinion, uh, quite onerous and something that I really dislike about those two technologies. In regards to, um, what I do wrong? Also hours, oh, depends sorry, on hours. We have, we have a hospital that, that only allows us to use it if- Eight hours. Eight hours. That's right. And you have to do eight. liquid QCs all over again. Yes. So I, in the previous slide, I sort of showed you the nuances of these three devices, but uh, I want to take some time. So I'm not going to go over it again, but I'll, I'm going to show you an example video of how this port really helps. Um, this device, of course, has the needle. This device has the needle. These two devices have the QCs through the measurement pathway are the same 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 sensors, right. which uh, 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 eliminates the need for liquid QC technology. But talking about reliability you now have what you see here, which is frequently the case. This device, this iStat device, you will frequently find having to be put under warm blankets in the operating room yeah, right. because it will not work in colder temperatures where we like to keep our operating room <laughs> at. And there are many, many, many times where I will come to the hospital and come to work uh, and be uh, having a, uh, a seizure essentially because I cannot get the thing to turn on because it's too cold and they're ready to do a lab. So I'm when glad you go you're not the to, only one. <laughs> yeah, when you go to this hospital, exactly. You don't want to go to this hospital that I'm that I that I'm talking about late for a procedure or <laughs> for an emergency because Correct. this is what you have to contend with. And, and I'll, you, I'll say what 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 I've tried is you put it in the blanket warmer. And then it just totally freaks out. And then it's too hot. <laughs> it's yeah. right. too hot. Right. So there's it's almost, too hot. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's just no hope. Okay. It's, yeah. And it's really problematic. Not to mention, you know, and I'm going to show this in the video as well. Look, I, I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement here, which may be a little bit controversial and I'll be a little controversial. You know, I, I, I tend to not hesitate to be so. I think that as a first generation device, it was a very good device and it worked no really well. But one of the big, big, big problems with it, and, 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 and let, me, let me move on to my, my, well, first let me show you this, is the <laughs> Siemens device, the rapid point that I talked about, they, the, there's a, 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 some researchers 
who needed to do laboratory, uh, point of care laboratory at base camp Mount Everest. Wow. The only device that they could find that could operate in those temperatures happened to be this Siemens rapid point device. So when you are in a cold operating room, I will tell you what, <laughs> that is not problematic with this device. It will actually continue to work. But I want to talk about something that is, in my opinion, much more, uh, <clears throat> much more concerning. And that has to do with the accuracy and reliability of the iStat point of care device for the determination of hemoglobin concentration before and after major blood loss or before dilution. OK, this is the thing that I think is the most important and kind of going backwards without going backwards through the slides. The other three devices that I showed you, the Siemens Rapid Point 500, the ABL technology, and the GEM technology, use cooximetry for their hemoglobin measurement. And cooximetry for hemoglobin measurement is a gold standard. And that is considered uh, to be um, uh, 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 reliable to laboratory to laboratory standards. In the case of the iStat, it uses a, uh, a, a oh, that's phototonic and, what is the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it, I just blacked out, blanked out on, the, on, the, on the name. Um, it's but an estimate. This is, well, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is done through a right. resistance, and, I, and forgive yes. me, I've just sort of lost my train of yeah. thought. It'll come to me later, I'm sure. But, Looking at this study, let's focus on the part in the red. Clinicians should not use the iStat hemoglobin in isolation for clinical decision-making when considering blood transfusion in a situation of 25% or greater blood loss. But when we go on bypass, we are diluting the patient at a minimum of 25%. It, yes. Okay, I don't think there's any question about that. In addition, this study, which of course, you know, we're not doing ne neonatal pigs, but I think the point is there, okay? Um, and this is the medicine, but it says the lower the protein values were, the lower the hemoglobins, hemoglobin values were measured by the iStat. The conductivity, that's it, it's a conductivity method, yes. and the other, right. of course, is coaximetry yeah. or, it's a or, 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 uh, uh, uh Photo, photo, I can't think of the word, doggone it. Never mind. Whatever. Um, but measured by the ISTAT, the conductivity measure, uh, based measurement of hemoglobin constantly underestimated hemoglobin values, whereas the photometric, there, it gave it to me finally, yep. method demonstrated a better accuracy and is therefore more reliable measurement of on site hemoglobin, of course, in this study in pigs. And here is another uh, 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 study done, and it shows, let's just, you know, you can read it if you like, but essentially the manufacturer, which is Abbott themselves, the company yeah. that manufactures the device recommends using its own POC device to make transfusion decisions. So somebody help me understand why are we doing that still? Yeah. <laughs> some, some, anybody, sure. anybody that wants to call in, in fact, let's just open the phone lines now, call in and explain to me how it is possible in 2018 that we are still depending on a device to make transfusion decisions when the manufacturer itself says not to do that. Not to do that. Because of its yeah. lack of reliability. Right. So, you know, the real question, has, well, well, we'll get to this, but... Um, Oops, sorry. So from our results, the iStat analyzer is suitable for point of care testing and it works great for electrolytes. It works great for blood gases. I mean, I think there's no question in my mind that the, the device is not a bad device. The device is not a good device right. for hemoglobin measurement. Yeah. So I don't want to, you it's know, make limited. it sound like I'm, yeah, it has, limited. right. It has its and I think that, you know, if, you know, you've got to make a decision, we have only so much money. You've got to buy a device for your operating room that you're going to be doing point of care testing with. 
Are you going to get two? Because this works really well for the blood gases and stuff and have that either, it doesn't matter, the Siemens, the ABL, or the GEM as your, just for hemoglobin, or are you going to use a different hemoglobin technology, or are you going to get just one machine that's going to do everything that you need seamlessly? I think you're going to be really impressed with these videos. I really do. But nevertheless, this shows basically the same exact thing. It's really good for, a very accurate for blood gases. It's very accurate for electrolytes. It is not good for hemoglobin hematocrit. So basically, you know, this text came across from this mother, your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Why is that funny, says apparently other the daughter or the son, and a son, obviously. It's not funny, David, what do you mean? Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Well, oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it means lots of love. I have to call everyone back, oh God. So, you know, it's, 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 it's how you interpret your results. What, are the, what, what does that number really mean? But don't worry, because we have an algorithm <laughs> right. for this, okay? And the algorithm is a thing you select on the iStat device that says, are you on pump? Or are you off pump? Well, should it say, are you hemodiluted or not hemodiluted right, right. instead? Yeah, correct. I mean, well, so when we come off bypass and we're using this device, this iStat device, and we have to select it, we're off pump. We just came off bypass, we're off pump. What do you put? I, I select that we are on pump. You select you're on pump, so <laughs> you're... Okay, but can that become a medical legal problem? Yes, uh, absolutely. Not, I, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, I'm going off of the basis that, you know, we're still hemodiluted, and I understand on pump, off pump doesn't mm -hmm. really mean on mm -hmm. pump. On You're going to have to explain pump. that to a jury, Patrick. I know, I'm getting ready. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're going to have to. Uh, and the what bottom line say? is I want to oh, yeah. give a good number. I feel like right. that number is a better number because it's skewed in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and I true. wouldn't say that to the jury, but, but I would say it on the internet. You want that? So, what do you, what's your? What do you think? No, absolutely. It's going it's to cause an issue. Obviously, it's it's really not an issue of the actual physical being on bypass or off bypass. It's it's about hemodilution. Yeah, it really is. I mean that that shouldn't really be the 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 verbiage. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I do choose on pump because, you know, we are still hemodiluted. diluted to get mm. the correct or close to correct values but, that but, it is. But, but is it? I mean, do you really trust no, I, an algorithm? No, I to don't. Tell, to take Personally, a number I don't. that is that using the conductivity method, method I can remember correct. the word now, yeah. um, using no. that method for measurement and then plugging in some algorithm to it to make it give you a different number. Do you really trust that? Do you no, trust I don't. That? I haven't I, trusted the iStat for a while, to be honest I, with you. I believe in co-oximetry. Mm -hmm. I believe in co-oximetry only because- And I think a lot know, of our perfusion colleagues don't realize this. I think a lot of yeah. our perfusion colleagues really don't understand. I mean, and I think part of that is the fault of the uh, all the other manufacturers. I don't think they really call on us very much. Right. I don't think they really consider how much influence perfusion has right. in the selection of the point of care device that we're going to use in the CVOR. Because we're such a small population. I mean, an iStat is maybe chosen for the OR because we are not the, the only users. And one of our hospitals, any nurse can walk in who's trained, can use the iStat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and whereas if we had a bench top, not excuse me, not a bench top, but a, a, a luggable device, as you call it, we have to be trained. We have been trained. I, I've used one for, for as long as I've been a perfusionist. Yeah, I mean that's that is a more reliable device. Mm -hmm. and, and I would you know, almost rather just send the lab to send it to yeah, the lab. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, to, today, exactly. I would rather send it to the lab. But let me let me right. let me let me. I, let me. I have a story that I think is pretty pertinent here. Please. And I'm gonna leave all the names out because <clears throat> it's it's that kind of a story. Uh, there was a hospital that we were working at, and uh, the surgeon worked at several hospitals and, and was wondering why we were giving so much more blood at this one hospital. 
And, you know, patient population was similar and all that. <clears throat> and the ISTAT at that particular hospital wasn't programmed to have the option to say on cardiopulmonary bypass or right. off. And so it was always assuming that we were off cardiopulmonary bypass. So we were getting essentially, well, we could say, we, we could say that they were false lows. False lows. And we were giving more blood because of it. Yeah. It was so simple. So let's once they, were, once they reprogrammed that, we gave less blood. Right. But <laughs> let's think about this for a minute. That's something I think about. You have to make the decision. So if you're the nurse in the ICU. They work off tr tr trigger numbers. So you're, yeah. well, 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 hear me out. Yeah. You're in the uh, nurse in the ICU and the patient is hemodiluted and it's giving you a false low value and it is within your parameter to transfuse that patient based on everything that we know about the deleterious effects of transfusions that we've been talking about. It, it is mind boggling to me how many patients I personally, you guys have, many nurses have, many anesthesiologists have, many CRNAs have, transfused that didn't actually need that transfusion. Oh. And that yeah. really concerns me. And I think that we need as a group to start being more vocal <clears throat> about the reliability in that will it work when you need it and the accuracy for every test that's being run. I think that either the company Abbott should remove hemoglobin from its cartridge and not have as, as an option, or we should just stop using it in lieu of something else that we feel confident in. And I think we need to become more vocal with that. So let me show you some more things that I think are very interesting. I'm gonna show you a video and it should start playing. I think it'll play automatically. I think I have it set up that way. Yes. So this yeah, is Rodell. He's not wearing gloves. <laughs> he has the eye stat. Okay, so there's... I'm old school. No Stephanie, gloves. if you're watching, you please put that on his evaluation. Yes. <laughs> so he had to go over there and scan everything, turn it on first. Now he's going to draw his, his lab. There's a lot of perfusions. I was watching you do this where you pump it back in like that. You're lysing all those cells. Now he's going to draw a sample. I do it carefully. He's going to put it in the device. Insert it. And now about two minutes later, two minutes, he will have a result. But I don't know if you watched all of the inattention or the attention that he had to give that device while he was actually doing it, sure. as opposed to, mm, go ahead. Well, I mean, I was watching prepared. the pump the whole time. I right. was prepared. I was watching the pump yes, the whole I, time. Well, I know. I'm just letting you but know. But let's just hypothetically right. say you're doing this with two hands. Yes. Right. And you have Correct. to now make a change or do something immediately on the pump, yeah. you're going to have to drop that sample yeah. and that's move correct. on. Absolutely. Okay. So that's, that's one thing. And then you, 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 of course, were prepared for this. So yes. you did this Pre knowing you were going to videotape it. So this was best case scenario. Now, correct. let me show you another perfusionist. This is the second video he had to send me. The first one, he didn't show something that I needed him to show. So he's actually off pump and pretending he's on pump. Now, it's Clint Robertson. He's clearly a better perfusionist because he's wearing gloves. I think everybody can see that. But they are off pump. He doesn't run his level down there at 50 cc's. It goes in the port. Wait, you, it's hits not the showing button. up. It's not on the... Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Let me try it again. Okay, yeah. so... Oh, yeah, look at those mm -hmm. gloves. <laughs> yeah, look at those gloves. Everybody see those gloves? Okay, so he draws the sample. OSHA must have been Now there. he's off pump. <laughs> he puts it into the lower lock. Now, if it was the other devices, the needle would have to come out and you'd have to hold it. Um, you know, it's still better than the ice tack, clearly, because it has coax symmetry. But this is the one that I really like. It comes out. He hits the button. He goes back to whatever he's doing. The sample is being run. You can see the uh, results will populate here. It takes roughly 45 seconds from the time you introduce the sample till the time that you get your results. Mm -hmm. 
and it gives you a little count down there so that you can actually see how long it's going to take. And he was off pump, so I don't know if you saw that or not, but the pH was like, uh, was, was the PCO2 was non-existent. But then it printed it and he took it out. But it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a good, at least, example of how easily you can run this device versus all of the little machinations you have to go with the various cartridges. And it has that secondary benefit of doing the liquid QCs automatically, it says automatic QC right there, through the measurement pathway, eliminating your need to do all of these liquid QCs. And it operates at extreme cold temperatures. I'm very supportive of the device. I think, however, whether it's this device, the ABL device, the GEM device, or other devices that may exist, I think anything with coaximetry that has reliability and accuracy is better than using the Abbott iStat in the CBOR for hemoglobin measurement. We need an alternative to it if we're going to continue to use the iStat. We should not depend on that value ever. Okay, you have any questions or comments, call in. Let me go to the uh, YouTube chat to see while we're waiting for that to happen and for that delay to tell yeah. them to go ahead and call in. Um, oh, here we go. I have used iStats and, and we did lab comparisons, I think semi annually to verify validity of results. There is a CPB hematocrit choice. And if you if there is a discrepancy, you can adjust the equation. I didn't know that. Oh. There is also an epical device handheld to iStat, but less expensive. Oh, EPOC, I think she means. Yes. And we also select CPB hematocrit for the first post sample. Great. Questions, Kimberly? Questions and points. And points, Kimberly. I am of the opinion that we need something accurate that does not depend on math to compensate for inaccuracy. So um, my first perfusion job, <clears throat> which was in 1820, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my first perfusion job, uh, I spun the crit. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. Oh. It was a little, a little too, right. and you'd stick some clay in the yes. bottom of it and spin it. And then you put it on a little chart. And I liked it for a lot of reasons. I knew it was very accurate. And also it was fast. Well, spun crit. Yeah. Basically right. what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Right. And then it took very little blood. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just thought I'd bring that up as a, yeah. I don't know if that's anecdote. even something that we could use these days or not. I don't know if that's, there is some judgment involved there. It's not a number that spits out that says, you know, you're at 20%. You know, you got to yeah. estimate basically, you're up probably... Based on your eyesight. Yeah, no, I think I think, <laughs> a little bit I, think off, but. I think the better thing to do, frankly. I mean, I mean, yes, you could, of course, put a centrifuge in there and spin a crit in the OR if you wanted to. I think that, you know, I think rather than go back to medieval days, I think right. we should advance. <laughs> I think, you know, and I think Kimberly has some very good points. I don't know if you all heard them. I responded to it. But she basically says she's using it and that I, you could do these things. Abbott can adjust the internal equation. So no math for us. That's true. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you there on that, Kimberly, but it's still depending on math, whether it be Abbott's right. math or whether it be our math really doesn't make any difference. You're taking a number which is wrong because it can't read it accurately and you're using an equation in order to compensate for that inherent inaccuracy to make it correct. And for, in my opinion, I think that is... Uh, wrong. I think we should be able to rely. We need a gold standard in the operating room, and that's just how I feel I, about it. Right. Um, I think that the Abbott iStat device does work very well for blood gases and for electrolytes, and I think that its functionality for that is just fine. 
Um, I think on bypass, it can be a little bit cumbersome playing around with it, depending on what kind of cases that you do and how you have your system set up. But I think that at the end of the day, I want something that is reliable, something that is simple to use, something that is accurate, that my attention, it requires less and less and less of my attention to give me more and more and more accurate results back to me. I mean, what say you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm getting pressure from a particular surgeon and he goes to all of our hospitals. So he sees the aberration with the eye stats versus the bench tops that we send down. And he's asking me like, hey, why are we using this? How come we're getting such low hemoglobins? I mean, now that we're going, hopefully we'll be STS rated. Are we trying to prevent transfusions? I mean, does this patient need a transfusion according to this ISTAT? I don't know how to answer him. I mean, I, I do have an answer like, hey, you know what, this this is usually two grams difference between a bench top. I know how to answer them. I'm going to give you the telephone number <laughs> of somebody to call tomorrow right. to solve this problem because I right. think the problem could be but solved immediately. I agree. But, you know, I don't have that power. Like, I am a big proponent of coaxymetry and this and this uh, device or a device that uses coaxymetry, you know, it, you know, it breaks down the, your, your hemoglobin saturations and, and to the, to the point where it shows you your met hemoglobin and it shows you that carboxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin. And this entail, uh, this shows you how much oxygen is actually getting delivered or how much content is of oxygen is getting delivered to the tissues. I mean, that's how sensitive it is versus this little cartridge of iStat. I mean, it seems like I'm beating up on iStat, but- Well, I've been know, doing it for I, the past 30 I, minutes. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I just don't, I, I wish I had an answer for this surgeon. Mm. I mean, I do have an answer for him, but can we accomplish <clears throat> getting a coaximeter uh, machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would have to be brought down to really a, a cost thing. And so right. the argument would be, again, what does it cost for a blood transfusion, which we talked about? Right. And what does it cost for this new machine? Right. And the well, what does it cost for this machine versus the other machine? Right. If it's cheaper, yeah. more reliable and yeah. more accurate yeah. and simpler to use, I mean, where's the where's the disconnect? I don't I don't know the is is iStat cheaper than some of the other options? No, I think it's the other way around. Okay, it's more expensive. Yeah. But again, okay. I'm not a you know look I don't yeah, I'm I, not a salesman yeah. for these other companies, right. nor am I a a, a a salesman against somebody. So I I have to I mean I've I've been yeah. pretty direct with yeah. how I feel about it. Right. But I you know. I think that they need to explore. I've given the information right here. Yeah, absolutely. You have these companies. These yeah. are the advantages. Yeah. You know, if it were me, what I would want to use, I really like the Siemens Rapid Point machine. I think it's a great technology. I've used it many different times. I've used it down in Mexico, and it works very, very, very nicely. Um, I don't. I do have experience with the uh, with the gem as well, but I don't like it because its QCs are not done through the measurement mm -hmm. pathway, and you have to do those liquid QCs. And look, I mean, I just want to be able to walk into the operating room at one o'clock in the morning um, yeah. and be able to set the pump up, prime it, go on bypass, draw a sample, stick it in the machine, and hit the right. button, and know that it's going to be yeah, on no and running and working. Yeah. That's no what I want, and be able to right. truly believe every result is being measured. As I said, I don't think the iStat machine should be thrown off the market and, and, and never used by anybody, because I do think that it has good utility for other things. But it should not measure the hemoglobin if it cannot deliver a hemoglobin value that one can reliable. trust and rely upon without having to make a decision as to whether to choose on CPB or off CPB when you are clearly not on CPB, but the patient's condition is similar to that that it would be if it was on CPB. So I'm going to pick that even though I'm nowhere near the even the operating room. I, I think that mm -hmm. that is uh, an right, just it's using a judgment an, call. And just <clears throat> using an algorithm to correct an inaccurate value to me is not appropriate. And I don't think it should be uh, be allowed. Yeah. I think that somebody I think it needs to be stopped.
That's what I think. You know, something we didn't even talk about is uh, there are places the, using VIA. I think it's called a VIA in line. Oh my God! Yes. Yes, I and I know that's about. not accurate at all. No, and, that's, uh, that's 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 terrible. But yeah. they do that. <laughs> no, they do, and and but yes, but I don't know that they're relying on that for uh, for for I don't know what they're relying on that. For. I mean. Do, where do we do we use that in any of our programs? There's a hospital. There's a hospital. I, I'm not going to say a name. But yeah, don't say there it's is name. a hospital. Yes, where but we work. Yes, yes. Okay. it's terrible, <laughs> but it's true. I, it's yeah. what they have. It's and what they have. It doesn't it's work at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I mean, if they don't have. Like we we ran into an issue where they did not have the correct. QCs. So uh -huh. we were we did not have a value system for a couple of weeks. So yeah, we would have to that. send the lab down. And that took 20 minutes at yes, least. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, it's, it's the turnaround time. And, you know, it's, it's these surgeons, you know, they're, they're starting to get wise to it. And they're saying like, hey, we've, I've done, you know, this, this bloodless surgery. Yeah. And we, we haven't lost any of this blood. Where is it going? Yeah. I mean, I know you're not hemodiluting. I mean, I know, the, I know the CRNA and the anesthesiologist haven't given, an absor you know, an exorbitant amount of volume. What happened here? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I, I've, do, I've done all this hard work and now they're going to get taken down by a couple pack cells. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to get this adverse outcome. Well, I mean, should we say, you know, I mean, giving a transfusion in that case is probably not an emergency. Should we be saying, I don't have confidence in this result. Can we please send this, send a hemoglobin right. to and the lab? and we have. And send we an have. H&H to the lab. Yeah, we can do that. I ha we have. And, and, you know, it's come back, you know, a couple of deciliters is higher. Um, but then that's it, pretty high. Seven yeah, to nine. Yeah, yeah, seven to nine. Absolutely. You know, and, and that's probably before we've given cell saver, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's going to be even higher. But, you know, again, it just makes us look we're, like we're unreliable. We're, we're using the the, you know, the incorrect instrument for what we're trying to measure. We are, so, but it's not our instrument. But it's not, it's but what but uh, agreed. It's what we're given. It's what we're given, but it's, it's, it can be a perception type thing as well. Well, then why don't we fix it? Yeah, I would love yeah, to fix it. I think it. what we're, I would we're love talking to fix about it. is, I think we need to be more vocal Becoming a proponent of, of changing the equipment. You right. Know, and, and saying Absolutely. this is a, right. you know, but Absolutely. being educated about why yeah. we're but making that decision. But I think how you do that is by every time you get, if you, every time you got that result, you said, I don't trust this result, it's going to start that conversation. Right. Or just ask I mean, for has. the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And say, we need to talk about this. What we're doing is not working. Here are some options. Here are the telephone numbers to the people that you can call about some of these other options. Can we look at this and make a decision? Because I think what we're doing um, can be done better and talk to the surgeon about it, anesthesia about it, the OR director about it, and let them evaluate whether or not there is a, uh, a value for a basis for them, you know, that if it's cheaper and it's more reliable and it works and everybody wants it, it sounds like a change should be made. Right. But, you know, it's actually, it's, it's, it's quite a fight institutionally as well. You know, it took a long time for us to get an ISTAT Mm -hmm. from a device that was probably at its optimum, you know, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, it's now we're trying to introduce a brand new device, mm -hmm. you know, so some, sometimes it's a fight. But they're not brand new. They've been around for a very but long time. But what I'm time. saying is just it's brand new to them. To the CVOR. To the, to the CVOR. Maybe. Yes, yes. So there's, yeah, there's that hospital. Mm -hmm. So what do, what do you think about this? Um, now, we do have a couple, and let me do this while we're at it. Let's see if somebody's going to call. I've, I've asked Kimberly to call. She, she's doing good with the, uh, with the chat tool, but I want you, Kimberly, I want you to call on this phone and discuss this matter or anything else you might want to discuss. But I know that one, both Patrick and Rodell are on call today. <laughs> True. And, and Stephanie, Stephanie, if you're watching, thank you very much, has been kind enough to cover Rodell's call um, and she's oh, watching an ECBO at one of our hospitals as we speak. And she well, did ask me to um, get you there as soon as possible because she did have a hair and nail appointment <laughs> that she needed to go to. Um, so uh, I was kind of hoping you'd um, stay for my talk because actually, that way you could this, okay, this actually may be a call for the, Actually, I have to take this. <laughs> okay, okay. So he is he truly is on call. And while he's taking Hello, that Rodell. call, let me talk about next week's program. Or not next week's program, I'm sorry. Our next program, which is going to be March 24th. 
And that program is going to be really, oh, we got a caller here. Hello, you're live on the air. Hello. Oh, hey, I have a question uh, for the panel. Yeah, who are we who are we speaking to? Oh, this is John Campbell. I work in uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital, Club Flat. Okay, cool, John. How nice to talk to you. Okay, I'm trying to uh, pose a question there. Sure. Okay, I, I wrote it down, but um, I didn't, we're going to text you and I'll just read it. So, uh, regarding the hematocrit on, on CPP, uh, low risk patients without advanced age, without pre operative risk for acute renal failure and stroke can be safely perfused with hematocrits between 18 and 20 percent. I think the, the literature you guys put up pretty much evidently showed that. <clears throat> I'd like to um, say that if, however, one needs to transfuse, it's best to transfuse early rather than late. Um, furthermore, I would surmise that <clears throat> if you could wash or you know, concentrate out broken fragments and elevate the uh, acidity, uh, I'm sorry, raising the acidity, so elevating the pH part of the CPD would be a better than dropping them into the pump while on CPD. So pretty much if you knew you were going to have to transfuse at some point in the operation, it's better to just go ahead and <clears throat> prime up with uh, blood rather than drop it in. And then I was wondering how much of the negative effect of the actual um, RBC unit is the fluid medium versus the actual hemoglobin itself. I mean, what do you guys thought on that? Is oh man, those are those are yeah. I mean those are great questions, John. And I I I I, I wish you were here with us right now. Um, you know, well, as far as you know, the impact on it, and maybe Patrick can elaborate. On, Rodell can elaborate on this a little bit more. Um, you know. One of the things I think that everybody recognizes, and uh, Rodell pointed it out, that you see this sludge in these older units of blood. And also, of course, they've sort of lost their morphologic shape. They're not able to, uh, they're not able to uh, distort and get pumped through the, the capillary, the microcapillary circulation. They're depleted of their 2,3 DPG. All of that combined, I think that, you know, those are all very uh, real reasons why it's easy to say yeah. banked blood when it's any older than maybe two or three days yeah. tops yeah. is really uh, not good. Not to mention the potassium. Oh, is very, increased very potassium. High. I was well, just about to there's say. There's tremendous yeah. numbers of lice cells. You have right. plasma-free hemoglobin in there. I mean, there's all these all these issues uh, around it. But let me ask you this, John, since you brought up transfusing early, none of us talked about, and John, I'd like your thoughts on this, uh, washing it, washing the bank blood was, in the cell saver. I was just thinking that before right. we actually transfused it. What are your thoughts on that, John? No, we, we do it. Well, I definitely think that would be a, a positive um, aspect if you could do it. I mean, you get in big trouble with it. The blood banks never find out unless you have some kind of protocol in the right. OR. I think really? the easier yes. way to do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the easier way to do it would be kind of like I did a nice write up from Gary Griss years and years ago. Uh, when, you know, pediatric, uh, you can't always do it like an adult practice, but it would be like, let's say, um, you drop two pack cells in your reservoir and then you drown it out with, say, like five liters of plasma light and just hemoconcentrate it all down, uh, down to, you know, whatever your priming line would be prior to CPV. That way you're pulling off as much, you know, you're deleting out all that stuff and then pulling it off before going on. Well, right. And then you depending get on it, that's a time yeah. you know. Yeah. And then depending on the filter, basically the blood filter to capture all of the stuff that you don't want going in there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, now you can tailor your, you, you can draw blood gas on that, uh, I guess, beforehand. Tailor up like, you know, all the numbers, you know, what you wanted before going on. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, that's a really good point. But let me ask you this, and 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 y'all are gonna have to educate me. What what do you, what is this thing about the blood bank? You can't wash bank blood in a in a cell saver and then give it back to the patient. What's that all about? I, I don't uh, know this. Yeah, I me neither. We we did it when we were doing pediatrics. We washed all the cells, and did the blood bank had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from of this? What I, from what I understand, it it, it has to do with um, <clears throat> oh, what was it? It was it was the standards in which how they collect it, and now you're altering that actual pack cell. So you, you've encountered that standards. before, where, where you, you yeah. had to follow a protocol to wash blood in the. Yeah, I know right. there was a specific protocol in my 
at my former hospital about that. And right. I did a nice write up on, I mean, I have to do a perf mail search on it, but there was a, a stream years ago on that as well. I mean, personally, I think, uh, you know, how to tie out of mind and, you know, if tree falls before it, it doesn't make a noise, but, mm-hmm. you know, unless you have find someone's going to turn you in for it, it would be fine, you know, but, um, I, I would prefer to wash it if I could. Yeah, I think that makes, well, I think that, that we didn't even discuss that. I think that would make a whole lot of sense. Oh, you know, makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. So, I, I John, let me, let me I, ask you, what's, yeah. your, what's your transfusion trigger up there? I mean, do you have a, tra- a, a specific number that you're using? Is it case dependent? Are you, um, uh, uh, doing, are you doing RAP? Are you doing ultrafiltration? What's, what's your practice like? Oh, John's not a well, RAP. John is not a big um, 400 cases a year. I don't know how many are like cabbage and so forth, but we have one guy that wraps. I don't wrap. Um, when I do one of the surgeons, I wrap. They're super fat. Um, we, yeah, we, we have, I hate mean, to say it, but we do have like a transfusion trigger per se. It's like probably like 7.1. Mm-hmm. You have to pretty much come off bypass at a, a hematocrit of 7.1 or higher. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's like uh, part of our TQI or whatever. You get flagged pretty hard for it if you, um, if you're below it actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, so, uh, and then they check it again in the unit, um, upstairs right after we arrive. And I think it has to be, at that stage, it has to be 7.5 or higher. Otherwise, we'll transfuse upstairs. And unfortunately, you know, like, it's not all factored in. I mean, I would say, like, if you were a low risk cabbage patient, it probably goes over 18. And then if you had diabetes, let's say we just made me off that number to say 20. And then if your age is like, I don't know, 70 or 80 plus, and you probably add a couple more in. And then if you're, you know, chronic stenosis or something, perhaps, you know, even more, and now you're looking at uh, probably lowest, say, hematocrit, anywhere from like 22 and, and up, you know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I, that's what I would think. It just kind of stands to the reason, you know. I don't have the empirical evidence to support it, but that's just kind of what I think. Well, I, 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 I do, you know, and I think that a lot of the studies that are out there, I think that there's so much data out there and a lot of it is very conflicting. I mean, I know I had a, a of course, you know, we do the conference in New Orleans every year. And one of the surgeons that came out, his name was uh, uh, Dr. Mark Gerdish. He's from, uh, where's he from? He's from somewhere uh, back east. I can't think of where he's from, but a big time valve guy. And uh, he uh, he was talking about hematocrits of 16, and yeah. we're not transfusing the patient right. 16. Yeah. So they are really, really They're pushing the envelope. But yeah. you know, my argument back to him was, you know, what's the what what are you talking about a patient who has a depressed ejection fraction, right. is very sick? Yeah. You know, is it not just really about DO2? If you have a normal patient and you're delivering enough oxygen oh, yeah. at a hematocrit of 16, I would say you're probably okay. Right. If you have a really sick grandma who has a really bad vascular path, has a really bad uh, uh, heart and had just had valve replacement and heart's not beating all that well, I mean, a hematocrit of 16 is probably not going to do it for her right. in terms Absolutely. of just being able to perfuse her tissues. And I think that, you know, kind of going full circle with all of this, you know, you could, I mean, even TCD wouldn't help this, but you know, how, do we, we, we normally don't measure DO2 in the, uh, in the, uh, in the operating room. room. And we, we sort right. of look at our flow and we look at our gases. Yeah. We look and at you SVO2. Can surrogates, right? Yeah. You can, if you're not developing acid, you're probably yeah. okay, right. but it's not real time. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has any, any, any <clears> experience <throat> with the uh, Lidco device or the L- Vigileo device. I like the Lidco because you can calibrate it, but that actually gives you continuous cardiac output non-invasively off of the arterial waveform, but it also, you plug in the hemoglobin, it gives you real time continuous is O2 delivery. So if it's about DO2, you can reach that threshold. And if you see it going under that, then take appropriate measures, whatever they may be, something else to add to our transfusion al- transfusion algorithm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think, I think another point I'd like to make is that in a practice like where I work, we can probably push them a little more so than, okay. than others in, in the sense that um, our, our procedures are really, really fast. So I like think surgeons are all right. pretty well skilled and CTB times for like capture is poor, probably under an hour, you know, like, so if you can go to a lot of places, you know, especially these small hospitals that don't do a lot of surgery, might, might not have the best surgeons. And then you're looking at a CTB time of like, say, three, three and a half hours, you know, and, 
and that's a lot more time to be you can't have an after say sixteen and if you know my guy I'm rewinding from thirty four to thirty six for maybe like fifteen minutes, you know what I mean? Mm. Where where they you, your oxygen consumption might be higher, you know. Yeah. So we have, we have that's something that never shows up in you know the literature really, you know. Right, exactly. And another thing that doesn't show up in the literature. You you're I think Patrick, you're trying to say something and we Well there's we, two things. Uh, yeah. just not to get too off topic, but John, what kind of point of care device are you using? <laughs> yeah, the iStat, yeah. iStat, okay. <laughs> really? Right. Um, right, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I still out of my but about, uh, yeah, no, no, no kidding. Uh, about uh, DO2, um, I'm not plugging any company, but Levanova, their uh, charting, electronic charting yes. system, actually can track that. And there are perfusionists out there who are you they're they're not even looking at their their flow they're looking at do2 right because the, the the machine will convert that for them and so they'll change their flows and change their practice but it has to have DO2. an accurate hemoglobin that's true right yeah so the, the that number will be reflective of whatever number you tell it it is right so right. john you're going to switch to mm -hmm. another device instead huh? of the yeah. iStat yeah oh, i have no idea <laughs> can O'Shaughnessy take care of that, or maybe maybe Mr. Cruz can? Do you know John? I do know John. Oh, you I, know I, I recognize. Now? Yeah, I recognize his voice. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, I do know this guy. A good friend of mine. Very good friend of mine. Well, John, how's Rodell doing? <laughs> It's been pretty good, man. Been really good. I'm not going to talk so far. So. Thanks, John. That's fantastic. Well, listen, th John. Thank you very much. Great, great thoughts. Great questions. Great comments. Uh, very provocative, and I think very thought provoking for all of us. I think we're uh, going to have to go to a break here yeah. real quick. So, um, but yeah, you know, listen to the next segment. You might have some thoughts on that too. Please feel free to call in. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Man. Have you guys having a good day. All right. Thanks, Cheers. Sir. And right. so next week, um, not next week, I keep saying next week, on the 24th, the Saturday, the 24th, we're going to have a really different kind of session. We're going to have uh, Dr. Michael Duvall. <laughs> that's M-I-C-A-L. She's he. She <laughs> is very attractive, not a male Michael. And she's going to be talking about basic TEE -E for the perfusionist, something that we all see in the operating room all the time. You know, we've got TE going on. And do we really all understand this very well? I mean, yeah, I general, kind of right, do, yeah, but yeah. do we really understand it yeah. and all the different views? I think this will be good for a lot. Maybe our younger colleagues don't. We're older. So we, I think we've seen it so <laughs> right. much. I think we we're a little better. You know, yeah, I right. can look at it and I can say that's not so good. But I can't yeah. tell you what, you know, <laughs> exactly. the details are. And right. then uh, to follow him will be or to follow her will be her wonderful husband, Dr. Lucas Duvall, who is gonna talk about how to read CT scans for the perfusionist. Definitely so good. when they bring the patient in, I've seen this, I don't know how many of you, but they start going through the CT and they're just wheeling down yeah. and the, yeah. the, 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 the neck is coming in, the top of the lungs are coming in, the right. arch is coming in and they go so fast. They see the, there's the dissection right there and they just keep going. Right. And I'm like, well, where, where, can you go back a little yeah, bit and let's right. show me where that is? So I think that'll be a really interesting talk with a lot of really good examples. And then to follow that is going to be Dr. Michael Duvall's mother or Dr. Lucas Duvall's mother-in-law, Marta Chalinsky, MD. She is a radiologist and she's going to bring in and do some basic x-ray reading for the perfusionist with how do you see where the balloon pump is? How do you see where the catheter is in the atrium? How do you know where all of these structures are so that you know how to look for them? What does a wet lung really look like? What does interstitial edema look like? What is, what is a, 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 you know, that kind of stuff? What does ARGE really look like? What are we looking at when we're looking at it? So uh, I think those will be really, I think that'll be a great session with some really interesting information for all of us that we just typically don't do. And it may not really be germane, except that you had a patient, you were in the ICU and you did, you know, what was it you wanted me to show you? I forgot what it was, the, the catheter in the right atrium. 
I'm trying to remember X-ray what kind of catheter. Oh, interfered. we had a we had a, uh, a veno venous ECMO patient, and uh, we had an Avalon cannula. Right, and, and you wanted and, to see it on the. You on know, the X-ray. there's no marker on right. that cannula to show you where. Yeah, I can tell you where the atrium is, but I can't really tell you where the outlet is of that catheter. So right. what I did is I took a picture of it, sent it to Joe because they were there ready to move it if we needed to. And, you know, you could figure it out. But I, I, did, I didn't understand how to right. do it. And think, I'd like to. You know? I think it'd I'd be like useful to. for yeah. all of us. Absolutely. I think, you know, good or even if you do understand them, I think it'll be good. Yeah. So that's going to be Saturday.